Hello, hello, and welcome to another Thursday webinar with Wellness Connection of Maine. This is your host, Becky B., uh, and we are here today with a very special guest expert, uh, Jason J.P. Paquette, is our Integrated Pest Management Specialist here, uh, and we are going to be talking about managing pests and other common gardening problems. Uh, so again, we've got J.P. Paquette, I'm Becky D., and producer Ben G. is making sure all the technology works just right for us here. So he's waving at you all. Um, before, we, before we dive right into this, um, a couple of housekeeping things. If you are uh, following along online and you have a question, feel free to pop that into the little chat bubble at the top where you can be seeing that in sort of a dark bar somewhere on your screen. You can just click on that and type your question in and, and producer Ben will make sure that we, uh, we handle those as they come in. And uh, we're looking forward to spending the next hour or so talking about managing pests and other common gardening problems with J.P. Paquette. So, Jason, how are you? I'm doing well, Becky. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for uh, taking some time out of, out of what I know is a busy day uh, here at our cultivation facility to, uh, to make some time and share some education. Uh, Absolutely no problem. I'm always eager to talk about it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, let's, uh, let's get right into, into things here. Um, so as you can see, we, we've got you uh, got a lovely little picture of you there, there with your lab coat um, and then a book. And we'll be talking about both of these. But, but, but first, uh, JP, let's, let's start by uh, telling us, you know, what, what are your responsibilities here at WCM? Yeah, so the, the IPM coordinator, um, basically is going to look at and put in policies, procedures, and certain types of, of things that we can do in order to maintain a healthy and pest-free environment here at WCM. Um, and that can be a lot of different things, and we'll get into more discussion about that mm -hmm. later. Uh, one of the large things that we will want to look at is cultural controls keeping pests out of your grow area mm. is one of the biggest parts of the IPM triangle mm -hmm. that that there is. Okay. All right. So you want to you want to make sure that you uh you don't start with any problems. Exactly. <laughs> don't introduce things. I got gotcha. you. Um what I I'm curious how you how you got into this this line of work? What's your background? So I've been in protected horticulture for almost ten years now. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, I worked at a large food production facility um, that had a lot of IPM needs. When you're dealing with agriculture under glass on a scale like that, um, IPM is very very important for a variety of things, but most importantly to protect the health of the workers present in the facility and the customers, or in our case, our patients. Um, always being a science nerd, <laughs> I saw people in the office looking in our, under a microscope, and I instantly identified that that's what I wanted to do, so I've been working to get there for the last eight years. That is fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, I, I have a picture here of this book that I, that I noticed on your desk, Knowing and Recognizing, um, and, and it seems like it's almost like a Bible for, for managing pests in, in the garden. Is that correct? Yeah, to a certain extent. It is specific to protected horticulture, so indoor cultivation of um, vegetables or cannabis or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it deals specifically with biological controls. So if you have any specific questions about a specific biological control or a specific insect pest, any type of information like that you will find here. What you won't find is some of the other IPM principles that I'd like to talk about a little later. Cultural controls, mechanical controls, things of that nature. This really only focuses on the biological controls, where I think most of the technical knowledge or lack of technical knowledge right now is. Gotcha. So it can be a, a great um, utility for that purpose. Fantastic. And, you know, you've pointed... Uh, you pointed something out that I think is important. I mean, obviously, we focus on, on cultivating cannabis, but the principles and the things that we're going to be talking about are applicable to, to your home garden, to your indoor flowers, things like that, correct? Absolutely. And you see more and more of a trend in the ag industry in general of moving to a true IPM approach instead of a, a strict chemical 
approach, mm. and there's a lot of reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the average consumer is much more cognizant of what's going on on their food or things that they're purchasing, and you see a very positive trend towards IPM industry-wide. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's get into this. We keep saying IPM, Integrated Pest Management. We're going to be talking about the principles of that um, uh, in just a moment. But before we do, I would like to kind of go through the the stages of the cannabis plant's life. Again, this is applicable, you know, beyond cannabis plants, but but that is our specialty here. Um, and, and can you tell us when am I most likely to encounter a problem in my garden, indoor, outdoor, et cetera? Um, you know, let's, let's just take it from, from germinating seeds or taking clones and, and walk us through what, you know, what's liable to crop up and when. Absolutely. So um, the, we'll start with kind of germination and or the cloning phase. Anytime that you have foliage in your in your room or your outside garden or anything like that, the big foiler pests are always going to be a concern from the time that your first proto leaves pop out up until the day you're doing your harvest. So that's the thing like thrips, spider mite, and aphids could conceivably move into your grow as soon as you have foliage. Wow. But one of the big things that I think it should be really looked at is the effect of fungus nets and short flies. Mm. During the propagation phase, these are usually going to be a nuisance once you're past your fourth or fifth week of growing, specifically because they feed on the roots of young plants. So if you're doing a clone or if you're doing straight propagation from seed when those roots are very small and there's only a small root mass, if you get fungus nets or short flies into your grow, they could definitely slow down your propagation, slow down the rooting of your cutting, or in severe cases of infestation, really kill off your, your propped seeds or your, your clone cuttings. Wow. Um, so during that stage, I think that's kind of enemy number one in my book would be soil-dwelling, root-eating insects, fungus gnat and shorefly. Wow, um, okay. Um, so, so, and we'll talk a little bit uh, in, in, in a moment about, you know, specifically... Uh, how to recognize those bugs, what to do to prevent and, and treat if you end up, uh, you know, having them. And, and I think it's interesting that, um, you know, you can you can have a very healthy plant. Um, I've seen this just buying, you know, house plants at a at a garden store. You know, they look very healthy, and I come home, and all of a sudden, there are these little gnats flying around. And and you're saying that that's because they're living in the soil. It's not something that I have control over. That is correct. Um, mm-hmm. The one time that I would think you wouldn't see them in an area is if you're using a soilless medium. If you're using something like rock wool, um, there's not a lot of organic materials there, and it's much easier to keep those soil dwelling pests out. Uh, cocoa, organic soils, pro mix, anything like that is, is the ideal environment for those types of pests. Mm-hmm. So there's certainly steps that you would want to take in that first stage to mitigate that the best you can. Okay, and we'll, we'll discuss some of those steps in, in a moment as we go through each of the d- different types of pests. Um, when I get into, you know, veg and flowering, um, in addition to these, these, you know, critters or bugs, um, what other uh, problems should I be looking out for? Overwatering, things like that? Um, for sure, overwatering can cause a variety of issues during your propagation, not only from just a growing management standpoint, but also... Excess wet soil is going to be a huge issue for soil-borne diseases, uh, soil-borne funguses, even some of the foiler funguses. So you start talking about powdery mildew or bud rot or something like that. If you're overwatering, you're putting additional humidity into your room Mm. or even outside. If you're growing outside, those of us who have or have done it before, you have a very wet, rainy, excuse me, summer. Yeah. then you're going to have much more issues with mold. So you definitely want to tie in your watering strategy Mm -hmm. the best you can to have it optimized. To help mitigate problems. Okay. Um, And let's say that I have successfully, you know, grown my my medicine, uh, taken it all the way through flowering. I have these beautiful, you know, uh, plants. I harvest them, and I put them through the drying process, and I don't have to worry about anything, right? There's no more problems that are going to happen once that plant's cut down. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> From an insect problem, luckily, no. Okay. But the, the big issue that we see once we move into the, the harvesting curing process is with secondary mold infections, particularly what they call gray mold or botrytis. It's a mm. very, very common 
mold, you'll find it on strawberries and tomatoes and just about any major agricultural crop. Um, and you do see sometimes some of the worst issues with that particular fungus after you've cut your plant and you're in the final stretch. Wow. So, there's, <laughs> so we can't relax. There's no stage at which I can just put my plants on autopilot and not, not worry about something, right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, with that in mind, let's, let's talk a little bit about this IPM, this integrated pest management. Um, you know, what, what is it? When we, when we say this, what are, what are we really talking about? IPM is really a, a holistic approach to plant health, plant and disease health. If you look 20 years ago, how the industry really addressed an issue, it was we have a bug, let's get DDT or the nastiest chemistry out <laughs> we can and, and kill it. Mm. Um, over the last 10 years, for a variety of reasons, um, we found that that's not the best approach. So you're going to look at what we call the IPM triangle, which is mechanical control, cultural control, and then biological slash chemical control. Okay, that is super important. Can you say that again? Because it's not on, on the slide here, and I want to make sure folks who are listening get that. What, what's the triangle again? Um, cultural control, mechanical control, and then biological slash chemical control, depending on what your needs would be. Okay, so let's go through those one at a time. Cultural control, what, what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So cultural control, and we'll talk a little bit about it later on in another slide, but cultural control is keeping your grow environment optimized. So you want to look at things like, I have spider mites. Let's say you had spider mites in your grow room. You know that spider mites really love hot, dry conditions. If you had a way that you would be able to bring your temperatures down mm -hmm. to less favorable for them to have high fecundity, high reproduction, that would be a cultural control. Doing things like not working in your rose garden outside before coming into your tomato garden or your, your cannabis garden. Mm. That is a cultural control. Having a, a clean change of clothes before you move into your, to your grow. So it's basically anything you can do from a cultural standpoint mm -hmm. um, minus mechanical or, or pest. And, and it, it's really it's number one, probably the strongest thing you can do. Prevention is really critical. Gotcha. And that's where it starts. Okay, so, so my, my environment. Uh, let's, let's go on to the second point on the triangle, and I believe you said it was mechanical controls? Correct. So you, somebody finds a, a pest or disease in their plants or in their garden, um, one of the easiest things you can do is remove the parts of the plants that you find that are infected. If we're doing very good scouting and, and looking at our plants regularly, we find those issues early, we're able to act on them early, and then you can mechanically remove them. Um, there's also other things that you can do mechanically, simply spraying plain water mm. onto a crop can sometimes dislodge a pest. Mm. You can do mechanical trapping, so a lot of the large um, biological control providers or even your local hydroponic supply store will have mechanical yellow sticky traps. Mm, okay. It's basically fly paper. Yep. <laughs> um, you hang those up in your, your room or in your garden and it's going to trap adults. Every adult you trap is a hundred less eggs or wow. adults in three weeks. Um, that's another really big example of, of a mechanical control. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, before we move on to the, the third, the, the you know, biological slash chemical, um, filtration is something that we haven't really talked about, um, but it can be, especially for an indoor grow, obviously that's, that's pretty important. Would you call that a cultural or a mechanical control? Yeah, so filtration would be mechanical okay. because it, it's mechanically separating out whatever you want from the, the water, but there is a chemical or cultural control that a lot of people do if you want to depending on how advanced you want to get, there are very simple sanitizers that you can add to your water. Some people actually use UV lights that you can purchase that will sanitize any bacteria or anything in your irrigation water. Um, and those can range from being moderately expensive to quite reasonable. Okay, all right. Um, and then finally, the third point in the triangle you said is chemical, I'm sorry, well, I should say um, biological slash 
chemical because as we see on the slide here, chemicals are a last resort, right? And that's one of the points of IPM. Absolutely. Um, they are a last resort and also with the biologicals, sometimes there are products that you can use that are considered to be biological control safe. Um, so the most important thing would be know what product am I using, what's the active ingredient, and what will that do to my biological population if I do indeed want to introduce biologicals into my crop. Uh, biologicals also work best when used preventively. Mm. Um, anytime that you come and you find a huge issue with one of your strains or crops in your garden, it can be very close to too late. And that goes back to saying again earlier, where you really want to make sure that you're monitoring it and scouting your crop as often as possible to find these issues early. Gotcha. So um, a biological would be like a parasitic wasp? Or? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. just about all the major economic um, pests mm -hmm. that you're going to find in cannabis, that's western fowler thrips, that's aphids, two-spotted spider mite, all have biological controls available on the commercial market at this time. Really? Um, and so there are options for all of those major pests that you're going to run into. So they, they have something that likes to eat them. Absolutely. And then we introduce those, and, and away we go. That's fantastic. All right. Either predation or parasitism. Nice, nice. Well, not nice for your, for your aphids or, <laughs> or thrips, but, but better for your crop. All right. Um, why is IPM so important? One of the biggest issues is, is consumer safety, mm. your own safety. If you're growing in your garden, you know, the, there's been a lot of talk recently about bee health and the plight of honeybees and bumblebees in, in nature. And if you use some of the over-the-counter products that you can get at the big box realtors without looking at the active ingredient on that, some of those pesticides are actually very, very heavy, mm. very, very systemic. They tend to linger in the environment for a long time. They could have a negative effect on your health, on your patient's health, on your children's health. Um, that's number one. Mm. Second off, what we see now more than not is resistance of insects to insecticides that have been around for a long time. Ah. Exactly what I mean by that is that if we're using the same chemistry on the same pests over and over and over for 20 years, eventually those pests, the population will no longer be affected by that chemistry. And you have an insect that you can't kill with pesticides even if you wanted to. So it's like humans and, and some antibiotics, right? It's a perfect analogy. Okay, wow. Um, another reason that this is important, and particularly I think if you're growing um, medicine for, for a patient, for, for somebody you know, that, that is not yourself, um, in Maine, uh, there are pretty strict regulations about um, what, what sorts of chemicals uh, or substances we can use on our plants. And, and I, I want to ask you, first of all, um, to talk a little bit about WCM's approach here. Do we use any over-the-counters here? We don't use any over-the-counter pesticides, mm -hmm. anything that we would use is EPA exempt, meaning it's not registered by the Environmental Protection Agency as a pesticidal product. Um, Got we it. use 99% biological and cultural controls here. Wow, to manage, to manage all of this medicine that we're Correct. creating. That's amazing. Um, and the state uh, does require um, for, for dispensaries and for caregivers that, that folks who are working with these plants uh, go through a class, right? We get, we get certified um, for, for application and, and to know what is and isn't allowed to be used on a cannabis plant in this state, correct? Absolutely. So anybody who, who's operating under the dispensary program within the state needs to fall under all the same agricultural or very similar agricultural requirements as anybody else. So anybody who's handling or applying these non-pesticidal products is licensed they took an exam to pass through. They were schooled by the state over several courses. Fantastic! Um, wow. All right, and we've got we've got the uh, the website there. If you're you're curious about this information, uh, you can go on uh, the state's website, uh, Maine.gov, DHHS, DLRS, MNM, uh, and learn more about about uh, how to become certified 
to use pesticides, which we don't use. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. And I would also say that if anybody has a question, they could reach out to the main Board of Pesticide Control mm. regarding even if, if it's cannabis or something you want to use on your tomatoes or cucumbers in your home garden. If you don't feel comfortable reading the label or aren't exactly sure what you're using, there is a division of main board pesticide control. Um, ThinkFirstSprayLast.org okay. will answer any of those questions for you. Um, and they get right back to me. They're so. super responsive. Yeah, and, and I think on the, on the DHHS website, there's a link that takes you to the board of pesticide control too. Okay. All right. So um, we're, we're sending away. We're using all these biological, uh, you know, controls and everything. That sounds super expensive. If I am growing six plants for myself, uh, how much, you know, isn't it just easier and cheaper for me to go up to the, the store and buy a gallon of whatever? So logic could dictate that, yes, especially <laughs> um, if you're going to, when you first get into biological and you say, oh, man, that bottle of persimilis for spider mites sure was expensive. What I would say is that the initial cost up front can look very bad, but if you have spider mites that take over your plant and you use a pesticide that they are resistant to or you live in a state like Maine where you're very, very restricted on what you can't use, that bottle of persimilis that was $20 in the first week certainly looks really good when you lose your whole crop to a pest and then your initial uh, investment versus loss just doesn't mm -hmm. add up. Gotcha. And, and what is a pers per persimmon? <laughs> persimilis. I, I got ahead of myself. It's a small predatory mite that they use specifically for two-spotted spider mite control. Okay, okay, um, so that's one of those biological controls. Correct. All right. So it sounds expensive. There might be upfront expense, you're saying, but if you look in the long run at, you know, the idea of not losing your crop uh, and of having, you know, very clean, safer medicine, it's, it's worth it, yeah? Absolutely, and you see more and more people in the industry that are coming along with this, even products like ornamental flowers. So people who aren't growing flowers for, or, you know, tomatoes for consumption. These are poinsettias for, at Christmas time, cut gerbers that you'll get in the store are moving to an IPM approach for these same exact reasons. Fascinating. That is, that is um, super interesting. We're about to dive into uh, looking at some actual pests here in just a moment, but if you are just joining us, uh, we are here with Jason J.P. Paquette, who is WCM's Integrated Pest Management Specialist, and he's helping us learn about uh, controlling pests and some other common garden problems. If you have any questions as we go along here, uh, somewhere on your screen there should be a black bar, and in that black bar there is a little talk bubble. If you click on that, you can type in your question, and producer Ben will make sure that we uh, that we get that relayed and, and that JP can answer that and help you out. All right. So let's look at some bugs, shall we? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, I started off with, with gnats and white flies, which I think are, are pretty darn common, yeah? They are, particularly fungus nets um, mm -hmm. in a wide variety of crops. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I do like the picture that you have here of the, the fungus nets on the sticky trap. Yes. That's the same yellow sticky trap I was alluding to earlier. That's from mechanical control. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Would you like to talk about biological control options for each of these? Pests? Well, let, let's kind of go through. I think with each of these, let's, let's talk about where they come from. I mean, we already talked about the, the, the fungus gnats live in the soil. So if you're, you know, you might bring that home with you when you, when you get your soil. Uh, and then what kind of damage, how to recognize, and then how to mitigate. And also why are the sticky traps yellow? And sometimes I also see blue, and I think I've even seen red sticky traps. So. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with where, where do these gnats and white flies come from? That they're unfortunately even here in Maine, they are present in the natural environment. There's several different species of white fly that are out there. It's the same thing with fungus gnat. It could be coming in with your potting mix. If it's not coming in with your potting mix, it's very easily going to come in from the outside environment. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, and what am I going to see? Like, how am I going to notice that I have? Obviously, okay, the fungus gnats will see them flying around, but, but is there damage to the plant? How do I recognize that, you know, when, when does it reach the level of a problem? 
Absolutely. Um, fungus gnat, the adults will not damage the foliage itself, unfortunately. So the adults don't do much feeding on the plant. Okay. What's actually feeding on the plant is, is the larval stage, mm. which isn't pictured here. Um, the, the picture that we see is the adult. That's a great indicator that they are present. The larval stage is roughly 10 millimeters long, shaped like a cigar huh. in green to yellow colored. It's going to look like whatever color of biofilm or algae that's on your soil it will pick up that color because that's what it's actually feeding on. Interesting. As well as the roots. Okay. So what you want to look for is a large population of adults. You can sometimes, if you're in a pot, knock the side of that pot. You'll see the adults kind of stir up off the top of the soil. Mm. And you'll also look for the frass, which is their excrement on the tops of leaves. Oh. There'll be little black drops of fungus gnat or shore fly larva. Um, <laughs> exactly. Okay. On the leaf. And, and that's pretty easily seen. Okay. Okay. And then with white flies, is it the same thing? I'm looking for the little larvae in the soil or? The, the white fly are a bit different. So in that part of the life cycle, the larval and the pupal stage is actually on the undersides of the leaves. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and for finding those, the same ways. Yellow sticky traps are great for monitoring a white flies, as well as the adults, which is what we see pictured here on the slideshow will fly when disturbed. Mm -hmm. So if you come in and give your plant a little shake, say good morning, wake her up <laughs> a little bit, those white fly will come out okay. and fly around, and they're pretty easily seen. They're small, but they are bright white. Okay, okay. And, and will they, are they feeding on the undersides of the leaves? Is, am I going to see damage on the leaf itself? White fly damage is very hard to come across. So okay. you won't see damage up into the point that you have a very serious infestation going on. Okay. The way that they damage the plants is actually through their frass or excrement. Oh. They put out so much sticky, what we call honeydew, uh -huh. um, that it will make whatever you're growing sticky and gross. And it's also a great place for secondary mold infections to occur. Ah. So even though you may only have a small amount of white fly, the excrement gets onto your plant, that's a very sugary, great food source for, for mold to happen in curing or drying. Gotcha. Okay. So in, in the picture of the white flies here, there's these little, like, they look like very tiny peas. Is that is that the honeydew? That's actually the white fly eggs. Oh. Okay. So those will be deposited on the underside of the leaf surface. They're going to be white mm -hmm. for the first 24 hours, okay. and then they'll actually transition to a gray or black. Those are also cigar-shaped, excuse me, <laughs> um, and they're very often deposited in a circle or semicircle on the leaf. Interesting. It's a great way to know that they're white fly eggs. If you see almost a perfect little circle of eggs, huh. very characteristic that that's a white fly instead of another pest. Okay. All right. So I have identified that I have either fungus gnats or white flies. What do I do? Is it is sticky traps? Is that the only thing? I, I, if I see white fly eggs, can I pick them off or scrape them off? How do, how do we treat this? If you do find an area for mechanical control where you can isolate the leaves that have the most highest proportion of eggs and larvae on it, you can remove those right out of your crop. So you don't need to spray it. You don't need to do anything like that. Mechanical with trapping with white fly and shore fly honestly is one of the best things you can do. I've seen it work better than spraying or even some biological controls. I'd always say get a couple yellow traps up into your hmm. garden or your grow and it's going to do wonders. Okay. Okay. Any, any, like, should I, should I be taking the hose and spraying them off or should I just stick with the yellow, the sticky traps? I would not recommend spraying them off, particularly in cannabis further into flower. You want to keep as much water off your plants as you can. Mm -hmm. Keep them as dry as you can for mold issues. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So we're going to go mechanical on fixing these. Talk to me about how come sometimes the sticky traps are yellow and some of them are blue and, and other colors. There's a lot of debate within the biocontrol industry about color of sticky traps. <laughs> um, <laughs> so blue ones have been shown in certain studies to attract western flower thrips better than yellow sticky traps. Aha. Uh -huh. They also, if you are introducing a large amount of biologicals or some specific types of biologicals, may be more attracted to a yellow trap versus a blue trap. 
So you might accidentally be trapping your, your beneficial your, wasps your good or whatever. Oh, okay, gotcha. What I will say, and this is a bit of a personal anecdote, that in my experience, I would use yellow traps 10 times out of 10. Wow, okay. So yellows, yellow it they, is. They seem to, to pull more thrips and white fly than the blue ones. Okay. And in the long run, we're, we're about trapping the bad bugs. Right. And right. so I want to get as many as I can. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> um, before we move on to another type of pest, how expensive are those sticky traps? You can get those from a variety of vendors, but you can get a pack of 10 traps for less than $5. Awesome. They are very inexpensive. So not expensive at all. That's great. All right. Let's take a look. Oh, gosh. I gave them their own slide because they, they give us such headaches and it's such a horrible thing when you see <laughs> when you start seeing them. Spider mites. So let's talk about where do they come from, how am I going to recognize that I have them, and how do I fix it? Yeah, so I think particularly in cannabis and a lot of agricultural crops, two-spotted spider mite is enemy number one. Mm -hmm. There's a variety of reasons for that. It's extremely fast. It reproduces very, very quickly. It can spread very, very quickly. And the chemical controls that are out there just don't work very well anymore. Wow. There's a lot of resistance with these pests. Mm -hmm. Their life cycle is very, very short. So you're looking at egg to adult in less than three weeks. Wow. And that allows them to really, really spread out through a crop. And how many, do you know how many eggs an adult will lay in? Oh, you've got your book. <laughs> so... At, we'll take 20C, um, which is, we'll say, roughly 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. A single adult can lay in excess of 130 eggs during its lifetime. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so when you, when you talk about exponential growth, one adult is 130, is 10,000, is a million. Oh, yeah. No time flat. A matter of nine weeks. It can go very, 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 very quickly. Wow. And where are these coming in in the, in the soil or the substrates as well? Or where, where, are the, where are they coming from? Absolutely. So this is another species that is, is present worldwide. It's present on a large variety of ornamental and important agricultural food crops. It's in the environment here in the state of Maine. Um, and it can come in on anything. It's hugely polyphagous. Polyphagous meaning that it has a very wide host range. It can feed on strawberries or roses or anything. They're also very, very small and windborne. So they could come in on your clothing, on your shoes, in wow. your hair. They could come in on pieces of equipment that maybe you borrowed from another grower. Oh, so I would always recommend to find a way to sanitize anything before it comes into your room. Wow. Well, that's just, that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to be doing gloom, but, no, but they are very, very tough. They're very small and they just, they find a way in. Right. Right. All the time, you know, and yep. that's why we take so many precautions to keep everything out. You keep it as clean as you can. Right. Stop them 99% of the time and it makes your life that much easier. <laughs> to just not introduce them in the first place. Wow. Um, before we get to, you know, how, how do we prevent and then deal with if we have them, um, what, what am I going to see if I have a spider mite problem? Because they're tiny. You're saying they can come in on my clothes. I don't even know. What am I looking for? You are. They are very tiny. And I really like this picture that we have on the slideshow of early spider mite damage. And what you see on that foliage there is what I always describe as a speckled pattern. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tiny little pinpricks where they've, the adult mites have fed on the leaf. They suck that cell dry. The cell then dies and leaves these little necrotic spots that are very, very tiny. Wow. So that's not something that's on top of the leaf. That's a place where the, the, the actual the leaf, leaf tissue has actually died. Gotcha. Okay. So um, I'm going to start seeing that. Once you see that, you can tip, typically flip the leaf over. Mm -hmm. More often than not, the spider mite eggs, nymphs, and adults are going to be on the underside of the leaf. Okay. That is not a all-the-time thing, though. You will occasionally see them on the on the top side of the leaf as well. Okay. More often than not, they're underneath there. And that's a left-hand picture? And that's exactly okay. the left-hand picture. And on that left-hand picture, you can see all stages of the life cycle there. So the larger ones that have the obvious spots that the spider might get their name from, that dark discolored area, are adults. Just to the right of that, you can see some little guys that are a little blurry, but those spots are still there. Mm -hmm. Those are the nymphs. And then the little round... The bubbles? Yeah, bubbles there are the eggs. Wow. 
And so you have all stages of the life cycle present in that very small area. I really don't want all stages of the life cycle present on my, on my cannabis plants. So, so let's talk mitigation. So I, I see these things, and well, we really haven't even talked about webs. I would imagine that by the time I'm seeing webs on my plant, I have a problem. And that's exactly it. Okay. Ideally, you would find the spider mites during the early mite damage phase that we talked about when it's that speckling on the leaf. As they get more advanced, they do create webs. Um, there's a variety of reasons why they do that. It helps them move about your room early, easier. Oh. It keeps the humidity levels down. They love dry air, unfortunately. Mm, mm. Um, but, yes, once you get to the point where severe webbing is, it may be best to think about, can I remove this plant? Oh, wow. Um, can I do some things to get it out? Ideally, we'll find it well before we get to that webbing. Gotcha. And I, I do want to point out that that center picture is obviously not a cannabis plant. That's some, that's a, a, I can't remember the name of it, but, but the, this type of bush is not uncommon here in Maine. So if you're out weeding your garden and you come inside and go into your cannabis grow, you may be bringing these little guys with you. Absolutely. I've seen them on maple leaves, wow. believe it or not, of a maple tree. Now, they weren't necessarily infected there, but they were hanging out there. Huh. I've seen them on lilac, strawberries, a ton of the foliage that's either native or ornamental this time of year could definitely be a harbor for those. Oh, geez. Okay, so let's say that I have, I have discovered them early on. We're, we're in, the, in that left hand, uh, you know, we just have a few, or we've got some speckling going on. Can I just pop those leaves off and, and be done with it? Absolutely. If you find it early, you're going to want to pop those leaves off put them into a bag and destroy them as far away from your grow as you can and as soon as possible. Wow. It's not a just, I'm going to pull them off and throw them on the floor. Okay, okay. Actually, that's a, that's a good point. Keeping your grow clean, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, some, some basic pointers at the end here, but, but the idea that you would just pick a leaf off and throw it on the floor it doesn't sound very medicinal, I guess, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And with some pests, it, it may make sense. With spider mites, you want to remove as much of that foliage as you can. And then monitor it very, very closely. So you've removed, I got all the nasty leaves out that I could. I'm going to go in and look at that plant every day for the next two weeks to wow. make sure to see if anything else is there. Also, I would consider at that time coming in with a predatory mite. Mm. I know they're in my crop. I've got to come in, put predatory mites directly on this plant. Okay. As well as exploring some of the natural oils that are out there, so cottonseed oils or something like that. Because um, that, what, what does that do for... What you're trying to do is actually smother the, the insects. So with those natural products, it's not an insecticide in the sense that you're using chemistry to kill the insect. It's actually a, a mechanical control. You're looking for a way to smother it stop it from being able to move or reproduce, or sometimes even those eggs can't hatch because they're just so covered in an oil. Gotcha. Okay. And, and if I see them on, let's say I have my, my six plants, if I see them on one of those plants, how likely is it that they're also going to be on the other five? It would depend on how early you found it. Okay. Um, also, air circulation is a huge thing. I would want to look at if I have a fan in the room, mm -hmm. what direction is that fan pointing? That's where I would scout next because they are transported very easily through wind currents. Because they're so tiny. Okay. They, absolutely. Wow. All right. Spider mites. Anything else about spider mites? Scout, scout, scout. They're enemy <laughs> number one. Really? Okay. Find them early and get rid of them early. Okay. Okay. And, and again, if, if I'm seeing webs, this is a time when I have to start thinking about whether it's worth it, worth it to just cut the plant down and cut my losses? I would say that it's certainly time to sit down and, and really evaluate where you want to take your garden from, from, from that point moving forward. Okay. Um, it's better to remove one plant out of six, in my opinion, mm -hmm. than use heavy pesticides that aren't even allowed. Right, right. Um, what about cleaning? Like, okay, so let's say, let's say I do have to take all or half of my crop down I mean, they're so tiny, it seems like they could be in cracks in the wall or in the floor or up in the ceiling. How do, how do I clean between, uh, you know, crops or, or, or harvests um, to make sure that, that the critters are gone? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that you get reinfestation into an area after you've, you've finished with a harvest or you plant in the same raised box that you did last year. Mm. 
Um, it's, it's super critical. There's a couple important things that I'd really like people to look at is use as many non-porous surfaces as you can. Okay. So plastics and metals instead of wood and bamboo. Uh, try to have as good of a sealed floor as you can, even if that's a piece of poly plastic that you put down over gravel instead of an exposed dirt or rock floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seal off any areas that you can. In an outdoor setting, unfortunately, <laughs> there's not that we're, you know, culturally right. that we can do. What I would say is outdoors that you would want to take any very obvious spider mite attractant plants out of that area. Things like very bright colored flowers, gerba daisies, wow. geraniums. Um, marigolds are actually okay. Marigolds tend to not bring a whole lot in. Okay. But you want to keep as much bright colorful, happy foliage away from your garden as you can. Because spider mites like bright, right. happy, And then you'll get on those plants and quickly move right. into your outdoor garden. So if I'm growing outside or in a greenhouse, is, I mean, how realistic is it to expect that I'm going to be able to manage, you know, eradicate all of these pests? In, in IPM, eradication is a dirty word. So we never, okay. <laughs> we're never going to eradicate. It's about managing the pests. So okay. through biological control, through cultural control and mechanical controls, if you get spider mites in your crop, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You just have to stay on top of it. Use all three facets of this and mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. And you may have a small incidence of spider mite right through your harvest, but you didn't lose your plant and you do an inspection on your strawberries or your tomatoes mm -hmm. or your cannabis to make sure that it's in the condition that you want for yep. your customers or patients. And then you should be fine. And I think that's what the objective is. Gotcha. Gotcha. So eradicate is bad. Mitigate. Mitigate. <laughs> Manage. <laughs> Got it. All right. Let's talk about thrips and aphids. Um, let's go ahead and, and we can describe them. Where do they come from? Uh, how am I going to know that I have them? And then, oh, my gosh, what do I do about them? So, so <laughs> thrips are a very, another very common pest. Huh. Um, depending on what you're growing, they may or may not be as much of an issue. Particularly in cannabis, mm -hmm. um, thrips, again, we're going to look at, oh, they're putting frass on, maybe some of that excrement's going to lead to additional mold issues. Gotcha. But unlike spider mites, they don't have the opportunity to quickly eradicate your whole crop, I would say. Oh, it's really? something that you would want to monitor. Certainly, if you have a huge population, you're going to want to address it the best you can. Mm -hmm. One or two thrips isn't the end of the world by any means, particularly in cannabis. If we were growing gerber daisies where they defoliate a flower, oh. nobody wants to buy an ugly, burnt-out flower <laughs> on a leaf of cannabis that's basically an unusable part of the plant, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't really affect it. So we'll want to keep them out the best we can. Okay. So the damage that we see in these two pictures on the left, uh, that I mean, that kind of looks like the same thing that the spider mites did. Or is that what they're doing? They're sucking the juice out of the, the leaf itself? It's exactly what they're doing. Okay. Unlike spider mites, those feeding spots are going to be a little bit bigger. Okay. So the, the speckle pattern is not as much of a pinpoint. Okay. It's more elongated. Mm -hmm. And also the thrips are a lot larger than spider mites. Their western flower thrips is 99% of what we run into in the ag industry, which is the picture we have here. The adults are yellow. Mm -hmm. They move about the, the underside of the leaf surface very quickly. Okay. So you'll see them running around kind of very fast. Okay. On Faster the than a spider mite. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, the picture on the right there shows them kind of sucking on the stem and the leaves, and then there's that black stuff. Is that their, is that their frass? That is the frass. Okay. Yes. Frass. That's a great word. <laughs> and you'll see that on the underside where you see that silvering on the top where they've been feeding. Yep. Flip that leaf over, and, and you'll be... see that black frass. That's also a very good indicator that you may be dealing with threat. Okay. Um, you know, you, you said something um, that, that made me think. So if I'm, if I'm saving my leaves for juicing... Can I juice, is it safe to juice a leaf that has a little bit of thrip damage, or would you say no? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. What I would say is that if you're trying to save your leaf, one thing that you could do is you put that into a dry room. The thrips will leave oh. your 
drying plants at that point. Because they're not because getting they're, what they like? They're not getting what they like. There's no food source for them anymore. Uh-huh. Those cells have dried out. They're not able to pull the fluids out of the... So the adult thrips themselves will leave your plant. I don't have enough experience with extracts or leaves to really say, I think that may be a personal decision hmm. for somebody on, on whether or not they want to use that product. And then it also <laughs> depends on how severe it is. Okay, gotcha. So we don't know the nutrient content of thrip eggs or frass. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about aphids. Aphids, I mean, um, you know, you see them outside, you see them in your, in your flower gardens, on your, on your uh, you know, fruits and things. Um, are they coming in in the soil? Or are they coming in like spider mites where they can just kind of blow in? Where, where are they coming from? Absolutely. It's the, it's the same types of things. Aphids are interesting in that with two-spotted spider mite or thrips, it's basically one species we're concerned about, the western flower cliff and the two-spotted spider mite. Aphids, there are tens of thousands of species worldwide. There's (laughs) probably 20 important economic ag species here in the state. Wow. Um, And so it it is a little different. Um, You may have a cotton aphid. You may have a bird cherry oat aphid on your canvas. So wow. okay. one thing that I would say is, is try to ID your aphids if you can. Really? Absolutely. Particularly if you're using biological controls. Oh. With the biological controls, there are certain predators or parasites that will work against one species that will not work against another. Unlike thrips or two-spotted spider mite, if it's advertised against those products, it will work against those. Interesting, but with aphids, you have to figure out. You have to use a book like like we showed in, in that earlier slide. Absolutely. And or or there are some great websites online that can help you do aphid ID. Okay. A quick Google search or the University of California Davis hmm. has a great IPM program. So that's ucdavis.edu and then search IPM. They have a very, very good aphid ID tool on that website as well. UCDavis.edu. Thank you very much. And if you're just joining us, we are here with uh, J.P. Paquette. He is our integrated pest management specialist here. And we are talking about common pests and problems in your garden. Uh, We just talked about the fact that there are apparently one billion types of different aphids. And, and all aphids are not alike. And uh, talk to me about this parasitic wasp. So what you're saying is that parasitic wasp, likes that particular kind of aphid, but there might be a different kind of aphid that that wasp has no taste for. That's absolutely correct. And it, wow. it tends to have to do with the body size of the aphid. So one wasp likes a smaller bodied aphid where another wasp would like a larger bodied aphid. Interesting. I'm, I'm uh, not really good with bees and wasps. I don't think I like the idea of releasing a package of wasps into my garden. That sounds terrifying. Can you tell me... Anything to calm my nerves about this. Absolutely. It's, it's something that I've seen or heard a lot of. <laughs> what I will say is that these wasps are 5 to 10 millimeters in length. They're the size of a mosquito at best. Okay. And they do not have the ability to sting us, uh-huh. luckily. <laughs> okay. However, they are great at finding, searching, and destroying aphids in a pretty cool way. So, so, so in this way, we're, we're, we're sort of eradicating, right? <laughs> <laughs> mitigating. Mitigating. All right, all right. And what is the cool way that they, I mean, it looks like he's, he's stinging him, right? He's just stinging him and killing him, or what, what's going on here? He's stinging, she, is. it's a female wasp, is uh-huh. stinging the aphid and actually depositing an egg inside or underneath, depending on the species of parasite, that aphid. Wow. What then happens is the egg hatches. A baby wasp will either eat from the underside or internally its way out of that aphid, emerge as an adult, and go find more aphids. Wow. One of the great parts about these wasps is that you get a lot of reproduction in your garden or in your growth. So you do one or two introductions, Mm -hmm. they get cranking, and they just start reproducing and going for you, which is a huge benefit. That's amazing. Um, I I have also, I've actually seen this in my own uh, outside garden. I know that ladybugs eat aphids. I mean, I've seen that happen. Is is that the same kind of thing, or are they doing something different? They they do eat. So these wasps don't necessarily, the larva does eat, but the adults that we're using, it's a parasite where 
an aphid is basically, or excuse me, a ladybug is basically a predator. Okay. Um, they don't lay any eggs on the aphid. They just eat them. They just eat them? Yeah, very okay. violently, too. It's somewhat fun to watch <laughs> at times. Um, so do, do you have a preference, ladybug versus parasitic wasp, in your cannabis garden? I do have a preference to parasitic wasps. Um, I think part of that comes from my experience in horticulture where we had open vents. So what I will say about ladybugs in an outdoor garden uh -huh. may not be the best bet because they tend to be very aloof. So <laughs> you'll introduce ladybugs, and they'll want to leave <laughs> as soon as they can. Really? Especially if there's an absence of price. So you're trying to introduce these preventatively. They're just going to fly away. To where there is food for them. Okay, gotcha. In a truly closed grow, mm -hmm. which is great to keep pests out, Right. It also has the benefit of keeping the ladybug adult in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I do think that in that type of situation, it can be an efficient predator for people. Gotcha. And ladybugs also make frass. Is ladybug frass as bad as, say, frass from trips or other things? It's certainly not as bad as the frass you're going to get from the aphids in your room. Gotcha. Um, so, yes, the, the ladybugs do put it out, you know, like anything else, there's going to be a certain amount. Um, the numbers are nowhere near as high. You'll never have as many ladybugs as you do aphids in a room. Mm. Nice part about ladybugs is they'll eat 20, 30, 40, depending on species. Wow. Aphids a day. Okay. Also, the aphids, the frass they put out is extremely sugary and extremely sticky, more so than just about any other insect. Ah. And that's where really your damage in your room is going to come from, is from not the feeding behavior, but all of their poop that they're putting onto your, onto your plant. That creates a beautiful environment for mold. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about companion planting. You had mentioned marigolds. Um, uh, I, in doing some, some research, discovered that apparently basil is, is a good companion planting for, I guess, certain types of aphids. Um, so what's the, is, is companion planting cultural, mechanical, where does that fall, and how do I know what to plant with my cannabis crop? It, it is cultural, I would consider it. Um, there are, if, it's going to depend on what you're trying to trap for. Okay. There are some general plants. I think basil is a good one. Mm -hmm. I would always, honestly, if for two-spotted spider mite, recommend bean plants. Beans. So string beans or huh. snap peas. I would just caution people that they, if they are going to use trap plants like that, that they do them themselves. So start right from seed, propagate on your own. Please do not bring a bean plant out of somebody else's garden as a trap plant because you very well may, may be inadvertently bringing a pest in with you. Wow. Okay. So you don't want to be importing more, more trouble, essentially. There's also something called banker plants. And what banker plants are is they're actually a plant that people use to rear and raise beneficials. Um, that can be a little bit complicated, but if you look at some of the IPM providers out there, they can definitely give you more information on a banker plant, huh. particularly for aphid biologicals and the parasitic wasps. They do work very well. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And you said ucdavis.edu. And then search under IPM, and they've got... Yeah, sure. um, some of the large um, IPM biological providers include Biobest Systems, which is B-I-O-B-E-S-T, mm -hmm. as well as Copert, K-O-P-P-E-R-T. You can go to both of those companies' websites, .com. Um, they do a lot of outreach. They will give you a ton of information on how to use their products effectively, how to run banker systems. Um, anybody who's interested in truly starting a biological control program be a great place to start. Great resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we're moving out of the in insect world, and I do know that we've got um, just a, a little bit of time left, so we're going we're gonna to talk molds and mildews quickly and then, um, and then point out a couple of other issues uh, that can arise and, and then finish up on prevention. So white powdery mildew and then botrytis or gray mold, uh, these are these are obviously not animal um, problems, but they they will they will damage slash ruin your crop. Uh, how do I get them? How do I prevent them? Powdery mildew in particular, or any botrytis. High humidities are are the number one problem that you can have. Now this is more of an indoor crow than an outdoor. I wish we could control Mother Nature. Unfortunately, <laughs> we can't. Yeah. 
Um, but in an indoor situation, you really want to keep your humidity down below 60% relative humidity at a maximum that you can. If you can go drier than that, that would be even better. Wow. But uh, having a very wet environment is going mm -hmm. to contribute to mold issues. If you're watering, hand watering your plants, I highly recommend that you don't get the foliage wet. Don't splash it over you, the leaves. Absolutely. That you okay. direct that feed or water directly to the media. Mm -hmm. um, as well as do that sometime in the middle of the day, depending on your plant's needs. Mm -hmm. If you can avoid watering right at the end of, you know, sunset or when your lights are going to kick off. Oh, to okay. To do so because that will help you keep your humidities in line a little bit and, more. And so you're saying during the, during the veg and flowering stages we want humidity under 60 and, and lower if we can? Yeah, up to a certain point. Anything below 20%, you may start to harm your plants to a certain extent. Okay. So between okay. 20 and 60 would be ideal. Okay. Over 60 is when you're really going to be on high alert to start running into mold or mildew issues. And so I would imagine that like leaving a, a five-gallon bucket of um, like a nutrient mix of water and, and nutrients in the grow room is probably not a good idea either, right? Because that's going to crank that up. Cover it. If you have a good cover, but yeah, absolutely, okay. standing water, anything like that. Gotcha. Uh, and then gray mold, it sounds like, is something that we, we mostly look for in the, in the curing and drying process with cannabis. Is that correct, or can it happen on a live plant? It can happen on a live plant. Wow. Okay. Um, particularly, again, it goes back to those really high humidity environments. Another thing to watch for would be plant stress or plant wounds. If you're doing pruning of your plants, Anything like that, those wounds take a while to heal, mm -hmm. and so you'll have a wet spot there. Right. That's a great, just like a person with a cut, it's a great place for infections to come in. Interesting. Do your pruning early in the day. Mm -hmm. Try not to prune directly into a bud site where your buds are very wet and dense. Dense. Gotcha, gotcha. And I, I think, you know, this picture is obviously a geranium plant, but if you've, if you've ever touched a geranium plant's leaf, you know, it seems like they're, they're kind of plump. And juicy, and so like a little bit of caterpillar damage is, is what you're saying is is like this, the the venue. It's like opening a door to to these mold spores, right? That's exactly. Right. Yep. Okay, gotcha. All right, we're gonna touch briefly, and, and just because you know time time just flies when we when we're doing these things. Um, nutrient deficiencies and and um, other problems, say with light or heat, uh, these are also things that that we want to keep an eye out for. Um, JB, do you have any uh, recommendations, since we can't go into deep detail on these, do you have any uh, good uh, sources or, or you know, uh, reading material that folks can do um, or, or websites that you particularly like? Yeah, I, um, for plant pathology, so not necessarily a nutrient deficiency, but if you suggest that you have a, a virus or a pathogen of some kind, some of the... Um, Cooperative extensions through the universities are very good. You oh. probably wouldn't be able to send them. I know you wouldn't be able to send them a cannabis sample, <laughs> but they have great online tools. One of them I really like is the Ohio State University. Okay. Um, OSU has a great plant pathology. That's fantastic. Department. And you said you said viruses. Correct. Plants can, plants can get viruses. That that is correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Wow. <laughs> this is um, you know you, you think that you're going to bring this little you know baby home and and. You know, it's going to grow up on its own and everything, but, but wow, so there's viruses, there's, there's pests, there's molds and mildews. We've got, we got a lot to do to mitigate and, and, and manage these little girls, right? And real quickly, what I would also caution for people is um, both pathogen as well as nutrient deficiencies can be very difficult to diagnose. Mm. They may express themselves differently on an indica versus a sativa, or this variety may look a little different. Wow. Joe's growing under an HPS light and Steve is growing under an LED light. That same deficiency may manifest itself completely differently wow. in between those two. So don't take it as gospel mm -hmm. if you look at one picture and say this is what it is. Really be diligent about your research and, and, and try to troubleshoot as many things as you can before you make a... Uh, a decision making changes to your growth. Wow, 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 wow. And it, it is frustrating that we can't, you know, send leaves off or pictures off to, to a lab or a, a school. Um, but that's a whole other uh, webinar, I think, the, the federal uh, silliness around this plant. All right, before we go, prevention, 
uh, in mitigation, um, I just wanted to throw out some tools that that can help the uh, the home gardener. So we've got um, uh, you know loops and hairnets and booties and and you know our beneficial uh, insects. And then uh, at the bottom right there, I mean you know I think the other things are pretty pretty self-explanatory. Although I would I would say that and this is just based on my experience, but people who um, have showed me or shared their grows with me, I, I am often surprised at at how little um, sort of, you know, the booties, the hairnets, the gloves happen in in personal grows. And maybe that's, you know, I mean, if, if you're comfortable using that medicine yourself, but but would you say it's important for somebody, if I'm growing my, my six plants, is it, I mean, it's still important for me to, to cover my hair and, and use gloves and things, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. And, and somebody who's growing their own medicine at home or has a very small crop, one of the big issues with this employee hygiene wear, it's the lingo we use in, in a large operation, is that it can be cross prohibitive. You don't need a beard net or a hair net. What I would recommend in your home grow is that you have a t-shirt and a pair of pants mm. that only go into your room with you. So you change in, go into your room in your favorite Beatles t-shirt, do your thing, <laughs> come out, hang it up, Yep. and that piece of clothing only goes in the grow. It never goes anywhere else. Gotcha. Wash it every, you know, wash it as often as possible with hot water that will neutralize any pest or disease on it. So some people get very, oh, you know, I can't afford to mm. buy shoe covers. Right. It's a lot of the same ideas that people could try to mold for right. their own um, own home use. Gotcha. And I would imagine shoes, too. I mean, because, you know, you're tracking through your yard or whatever. You, you want a dedicated, you know, cultivation room for Absolutely. shoes. Absolutely. That old pair of rusty tennis shoes you were going to throw away, instead of throwing them away, spray them down with a good bleach product, mm -hmm. let them soak, put them through the dryer at 125, 130 degrees, and then put them in your grow room, and they can be your grow room shoes. Nice. This way you're not tracking in spider mites on the bottom of your feet. Love it, love it. Um, and and finally, we kind of touched on this before we came on air. Uh, why why the big red you know slash through all the pets? I love my cat. I love my dog. Uh, you know they like to come into the grow and help me do my pruning and stuff. Uh, why is that a bad idea? Besides the fact that you know maybe some people may want pet dander or, or whatever around. I know that m mostly patients wouldn't. Just, you know, if we're concerned about my short hair bringing in spider mites, your cat is, <laughs> I don't want to think, especially if it's an outdoor cat, where they've been, all that hair, the mm. ability of insects to hide on a pet is, is just 10 times worse than what it would be for a person. So gotcha. I would highly, highly suggest that you don't let Sparky in the... Uh, Sparky doesn't get to go in the grill anymore, huh? Right. All right. Well, and I will say that it also cuts down on um, pet fur. Um, when I was uh, a buyer out in, uh, at a dispensary in California, that was, I mean, I, I got to the point where I could identify cat fur and, and dog fur and human fur, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, and it is sad because, uh, you know, my cats, for whatever reason, cannabis is very similar to catnip for them. They love it, love it, like to rub up against it and everything, but we don't want the, we don't want cat fur in our, in our finished product, right? No, or, <laughs> or or the bugs they may be carrying. Exactly. All right. Well, JP, it has been a pleasure to spend some time with you. I know we're a little bit over time, um, and I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, I think you have been super thorough, and and we have really appreciated you spending you spending an hour with us. Uh, again, this is uh, this is JP. He is our integrated pest management specialist here at WCM. Uh, again, JP, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Uh, and this is Becky D and producer Ben, and we are signing off for another month. We will see you uh, the fourth Thursday in June, and you have a fantastic rest of your day.